patrols and maintain a visible S-4 presence in Bosnia. Helicopters come with a warning, handle with care. They're dangerous to fly and even to enter and exit. The main hazard areas on the aircraft obviously are the tail rotor. If you come under there, uh, A, we can't see you and B, uh, at the moment it's sitting about seven or eight feet above the ground but on softer ground it can be down to about five or six feet and it's a very obvious meat cleaver so we don't go around there. For coming further forward, we've got the uh, flares uh, for our self-defense from the uh, missile threat and the jammer also from missile threat. The flares for heat-seeking missiles and the jammer for uh, infrared. You come round to the exhaust when you've got hot air, but they generally are above your head. Um, not a serious problem. Noisy and distracts people. And then further round, you've got antenna on the front. Uh, and troops come in, go round either side of the aircraft. And if they get too close, their kit can snag on the antennas and rip them off. But then aren't you meant to go in at the side? You are. In fact, with the single rotor helicopter, you can go in from anywhere from the doors forward, including with the Puma coming in from dead ahead and then round the nose on either side. Uh, unlike single the Chinook where, and the Merlin when it comes out, where the loading is from the rear. And then the glass, fairly, fairly... Uh, sort of tender and can easily be broken if people are not paying attention. The other hazard, of course, is a main rotor disc. When, uh, when the rotors are running, they're standing about 16 feet above the ground. But if you're on sloping ground uh, or on even ground, they can get very close to the, to the uh, ground. If you run in and out, you can sort of shave the top off your head to, without too much difficulty. The three windscreens are reinforced uh, because the early ones weren't and we found that uh, the average sized bird flying around the UK would, would actually, if it impacted, come straight through. And there are many pilots who have had black eyes and fortunately none blinded. But we, we frequently get birds coming through these and they land up underneath the seats and you're covered in blood and gore. Every six weeks the air crews are rotated. Today, two outgoing crews are ready to fly home. Done. Yep. Hot mills. Mm -hmm. We've got electric charts. Yep. So if you just go and ring vents to make sure they know to send the no times through first thing in the morning okay. and the weather for the routing with the weather forecast, that'd be great. Right We're going for 8:30 here, so we can brief at nine. Lift the tap. Okay. All right. All right. One of the outgoing crews is all women. They're facing a three-day flight back to Britain. Squadron leader Sarah Slingsby is one of 18 women helicopter pilots in the RAF out of a total complement of 536 pilots in all. I've got um, two female navigators with me and a female crewman. A couple of years ago it was very rare because we had, as I say, a very few female navs and female crewmen. We now have a lot more, um, we've got more female pilots, so the squadrons have, have enough that it, it can happen. I didn't. Stu is the incoming pilot. A Canadian with a British mother, he decided to join the RAF. His navigator is Jerry the Czech. They've kept their surnames confidential in case they're shot down in action and the information can be used against them. They're also evasive about their roles when flying. <coughs> well, sometimes we're not so sure, but uh, Jerry's a nav and uh, I'm a pilot. So, um, you know, there's plenty of banter on who does what, but well, he's scoring the goals actually at the moment. And, uh, I score the goals, and, or he scores the goals when I talk, I guess, I don't know. <laughs> After just one day's familiarisation training, the men will be taking over from the women. Oh. And from your point of view, have you ever felt um, any pressure? I mean, is it... No. No. I'm, I'm, I do know women that have, and it is difficult, but I've been very lucky. Everybody that I've, I've worked with has given me a fair chance, the same as I've given them, and I've never had any problems. I've always had great support from the team that I've been working with, the same as I'd like to think I give the support back. When you started off in the RAF, were there many um, women pilots? There were none then, no. Uh, the, the female pilots really have only come along in the last 15 years or so. And what's that like? It's just another chatterbox in the cockpit. <laughs> Flight Lieutenant Chris Mullen is the chatterbox in the cockpit is going to be taking Stu and his crew out for their Bosnia familiarisation training. It's different from working in the UK. Um, the, it's a different environment. 
there's a great deal more mountainous regions. It's only, say, 20 miles away from here at Banyu Luka, up to 5,500 feet, which we don't generally get in Oxfordshire. Um, the weather can be very changeable, and it's a lot colder here than in the winter than it is in the UK, creating problems with snow um, and low cloud and fog. And also, there are a great deal more wires here, and the maps aren't as reliable as they are in England, and therefore we have to be a great deal uh, more careful than we are in the UK over obstructions when we're flying. Before going up, the helicopter gets a thorough last-minute inspection. It's the loadmaster's job to look after safety in the air and on the ground. Flight Lieutenant Warwick Crichton has been in the RAF for 42 years, and despite the risks, he's still flying. I've, uh, I've had a couple of crashes in helicopters, and uh, I've had uh, sort of minor scares in fixed-wing aircraft, and it hasn't put me off yet. And. Um when you say it's dangerous, I mean, do you know people who have been killed? I do indeed, yes. A lot of my friends have died in helicopters. Yeah. And it still will put you off? No. I take special care of myself. The pilots relish the Bosnia posting. The tours are only six weeks long, so that as many pilots as possible can get a chance to come out here. They get more flying time here than back in the UK, and so can overcome skill fade as the RAF jargon has it. Today's weather reports are good, an ideal day for an aerial recce of Bosnia, but the weather can change very rapidly in the mountains. They head out over nearby Banja Luka, one of the centres of fighting during the civil war of the early 90s. Military flying means low flying, but in Bosnia, low flying is dangerous, even suicidal. Primarily, um, a helicopter is a big, slow-moving target and uh, it's noisy. If it's heard, the enemy can take time to get their missiles wound up and uh, to train their guns. And, however, they can't shoot at you unless they can see you. And if you don't give them enough warning, they can't let their missiles warm up in time to, to align on you. So low is safe uh, as far as that threat is concerned, but then, of course, you've got the wires threat and things like that. If you have a mountain valley with some high tension cables running across the centre of the valley, um, you can have them quite high up. Normally we fly around in the UK um, on maps that have every wire marked, so we don't really get, have any surprises. You know exactly where everything is. However, out here, wires spring up, the maps aren't necessarily kept up to date. We have to do it ourselves. So it's just to show us the latest set of wires that aren't on the map um, so that we're aware of them, we know where they are. And that way, if we're groveling around in low, in bad weather conditions, we can uh, find our way home without, without any hassle. It's time for squadron leader Slingsby and her crew to take off for home. What was it that attracted her to flying in the first place? Apparently, um, my mum has pictures of me drawn and my dad has poems that I wrote when I was about six years old with helicopters and aircraft in. Um, so I must have wanted to do it from an early age. I wasn't particularly aware of that as I went through. Uh, but when I chose my university, I made sure uh, that as well as being good at university, it had a university air squadron because I very much wanted to fly and wanted the opportunity to fly. And then while I was at university, the Air Force opened the door to female pilots, so I took them up and they took me, and there we are. So can you remember your first flight? Yes, I can. I was dead scared because I thought, having worked so hard to get there, what if I get in an aircraft and I hate it, or I'm sick, or I can't do it? Um, so I was petrified, and once I got airborne, it was just brilliant. I think I had the biggest smile on my face for the whole time. Sarah has found it easy to adapt to the military lifestyle, and says the RAF have accepted women pilots in turn. I had no, no adverse comments, no sort of startled looks at, at, at all. 
Uh, I think people are getting much more familiar in the military with working with, with women of all ranks. There's always going to be what we say is banter. There's, there's always going to be comments and ribbing, and it doesn't matter whether it's because you, you haven't washed your hair that day, you've got a slightly different piece of uniform, you're a different um, sex, whatever. And there's, there's always obviously a limit beyond which it starts to become offensive. Most people know where that limit is and you can very quickly pick up on it. And that's the point where you'd want to take action if somebody was starting um, to, to, to treat me differently because of being a woman um, or putting me down. Then certainly I would, would act, but that's never happened. Well, how did people react, like your mum and dad, when you said you wanted to do, become a pilot? They were quite surprised because we have absolutely no military connections whatsoever. So they were sort of quite surprised, are you sure? And then, typically, as they always have done, supported me all the way through. I think they have a mixture of great pride in the job that I'm doing. And when mum looks up and sort of sees aircraft flying over and can say, you know, my daughter does that, she's, she's quite proud and absolutely terrified and scared every time I go into an operational theatre or, or perhaps into an environment that they know could be quite dangerous. Coming up, how much does it cost to fill her up? I had to pay cash for fuel uh, about a year ago at an American base. And landing in Bosnia can be a dangerous game. A replacement crew of 33 Squadron is making its maiden flight across Bosnia's rugged terrain. The loadmaster is the eyes and ears of the pilot as they take unfamiliar routes and make unplanned landings and takeoffs. In flight, normally sort of follow with a map, with a map to make sure that uh, uh, people go to the crew go to the right place. And the distractions quite often lead to uh, wrong valleys being taken, and then things can get quite serious if you've got wires and hazards. Uh, but I'm also there to make sure that the aircraft is not going to be landed in, in a hazardous area. Look out, sort of assess the approach path, and uh, advise the captain as to which way he should go, how high or low, if his speed's correct, and if it's safe to land. In flight, the loadmaster also oversees cabin weight distribution, the winch, and in wartime, the helicopter's machine guns. Crash control to Springfield. Helicopters consume serious quantities of fuel and can't stay in the air for much more than 100 minutes at a time. Like all aircraft, they need constant support if they're to be of any use. An army or an air force is only as good as its support system. Here, the helicopter is going for hot refueling, taking on jet fuel while the engine is still running. So the aircraft coming in and shutting down, shutting off its engines and then refueling, we can do it with the engines running, it just saves time on the aircraft's uh, airframe because obviously they're limited to how many hours they can fly. Here again the loadmaster plays a crucial role. During hot refueling it's too noisy to communicate with the ground staff. So the pilot gives fuel dial readings to the loadmaster over the intercom. The loadmaster in turn lets the ground crew know about progress by hand signals. We use about uh, uh, half a tonne an hour, um, we only carry one tonne, uh, so and we have a minimum landing fuel of 100 kilograms, and uh, that gives us about an hour 40, normal operating, and then we have to go for fuel. God, that must cost quite a lot of money, isn't it? No, jet fuel's cheap. Is it? <laughs> yes. Um, I, had to, I had to pay cash for fuel uh, about a year ago at an American base and uh, to fill the aircraft up with 800 kilograms of uh, jet fuel cost me $106. We have a civilian contractor from uh, Zagreb in Croatia who delivers our fuel for us and uh, like I say every two weeks or so we get about a tanker with 30,000 litres in comes down and we uh, refill the tanks from that. They're probably about two weeks worth at least in there of normal flying. Really? Only two weeks worth? Oh yes. 
I mean, in each, each aircraft can take up to or about one and a half thousand litres on a full load. What would happen if you were actually doing it in sort of like a proper war situation? What we do, we have what they call a tank fabric collapsible. It's basically just like a big bag on the floor that we fill with fuel there and we run off pipes and pumps and filters from that as well. This is a nice permanent set or semi-permanent setup here. So it's a lot easier for us to operate, but in the field, yes, everything would be just bare field, put the tanks down, connect the pipes, and off we go. There's another problem about flying helicopters in Bosnia, mines. There is a big problem with mines here. Bosnia is very heavily mined. Um, so that means that we can't generally land um, anywhere in any, any field that we would normally like to. Uh, we only land on hard standings or places that have been cleared by the EOD team. If we had to make an emergency landing, we would attempt to make some form of hard standing, be it a road or somewhere close to maybe a school or a road that would necessarily be, have been cleared because children would have been playing in that area. At the present rate of progress, it'll take over a century to clear all the mines in Bosnia. Yet the crews must always be ready to put down in an emergency. Because the roads are poor here and the weather can be so bad, we may be stuck out for 24 hours. So we need to make sure that we've got enough survival equipment to survive for that 24 hour period. Um, the pack has survival equipment, um, sleeping bags and sleeping systems, so we would be kept warm overnight. Spare clothing, um, cooking systems and food and survival rations in there, amongst other things such as compasses, knives and uh, candles and things that are going to keep us going for a 24 hour period. For Flight Lieutenant Warwick Crichton, it's been one more flight to enjoy. He's one of the RAF's oldest serving flying officers and is retiring in 2004. Flying has been his lifelong passion and is still a huge pleasure. I've always wanted to fly and I started flying with my father who was an RAF fighter pilot and that's what I really wanted to be, but uh, didn't study hard enough at school. So have you, ever, have you ever been a pilot? I have, yes. I have a uh, civil pilot's license, which uh, I've had since I was 17 years old, and I've also got an RAF um, set of wings for flying motor gliders for the Central Flying School. If it's so dangerous, and you know it's so dangerous, why, what is it that you like about it? It's the camaraderie, the, uh, the satisfaction of doing the job sort of safely and efficiently and uh, coming away having achieved. After the flight, it's time for a debrief and preparation for a night flight. Then the new crew's on its own. This is an Osprey for low level. We saw that there aren't many wires around this sort of area. Once we've got this wreckage, we'll be able to get down to 50 feet and keep our uh, skills up so we don't get skill failure out in the theatre. But until you've actually had a really good record of places, beware and don't get yourself right down in the weeds. Keep the heart up a little bit and have a good look around. Mm -hmm. So points to take home. There are a lot of wires out there. Be careful in bad weather. We generally fly about a thousand feet to avoid the annoyance for the local populace, obviously. And apart from that, I haven't got any other debrief points. Anything from you, Jack? No? Steve? No? That was good. What? No. Okay, okay. thanks a lot, guys. Well, we'll get back together. And then uh, once we've planned tonight's route, we'll have a brief and we'll go fly the same thing in the reverse route tonight. For squadron leader Slingsby and her crew, it's time to fly home. Is everybody OK? Bit of a rush then. You've got crash kit on. We're actually flying one of the aircraft the Pumas here back across Europe. The aircraft is due to go into second line maintenance, which needs to be done back in the United Kingdom. We can't do that back here. There's some weather fronts coming across Europe that are going to cause us some interesting flying days to get through it. But we, we should be able to do it with a couple of night stops and several refuels each day. I've had a, a fantastic time. And you, you see the good and you see the bad, and you see some spectacular views. 
and sometimes you see some devastation. It's very difficult to understand how anybody can destroy such a beautiful country, but it's had its problems. Not a clip. Stag formation, ten persons on board each aircraft. I was here in 1995, uh, in the middle of the war, and it's great to come back and see the country rebuilding itself, which it very much is doing. And I just, just hope that it can keep going and keep going, and that in years to come, S4 won't have to be here because the country will be able to stand alone without the support. Peacekeepers in Bosnia. The British Army has been here for more than a decade through one of the bloodiest civil wars of the last century. They are part of the multinational NATO force, S4. Their job, to stop a new outbreak of war. Every six months, a fresh regiment arrives. For the first time, the British Army has allowed cameras to follow its Bosnian peacekeepers in action. Today, why the only safe way into a minefield is from the air. Which is tough if you're allergic to this vital part of your job. I don't really like the winching as, as my job, like it's not a part of it that I enjoy, but if, if we need to do it, we need to do it, obviously, so. And if Bosnian children don't learn the A to Z of landmines, there's a serious danger they'll get blown up. The war in Bosnia went on for three and a half years. It left a terrible legacy, not just in people's minds, but in the land, too. There are 19,000 charted minefields in the country, and many are not on the maps. NATO has instant response teams to react immediately to mine incidents, to an explosion or to the danger of one. This is the IRT briefing room. I'm Sergeant Dare, part of 3th Engineer Regiment, and I'm the IRT commander. The IRT is the immediate response team. We're a team that are effectively used in theatre to help vehicles and people that need a quick response for help. For instance, if a vehicle has gone into a minefield, uh, there's a casualty injured in the vehicle, and there's obviously no way of getting into it in a quick time. What we have is a helicopter asset and other assets within the IRT to get there and help the casualty and to free the casualty. Let's go, huh? Let's go. The IRT is multinational with a Dutch helicopter crew and medics and British explosives experts. They're not called out often, two or three times a year, but when they are, it's always a serious incident. They train repeatedly. Without the daily routine, the IRT could end up killing people, not saving them. Today, they're taking up some of the regular team members, as well as others who need to know what immediate response really means. I'm an anaesthetic nurse. I'm a member of the IRT team. So I go in and... Uh, uh, when there is a uh, real uh, ERT uh, call. For the uh, anesthetic uh, nurse, it's necessary that they have to do it. But for the scrub nurse, I'll be waiting in theatre when they arriving with the patient. But when there's a time, they let us participate. So uh, knowing what it's what's feeling when they really have to go to do it for real, then you know what they're up to. I've done it several times now, I don't really like it, but no. I don't like it, no. It, it um, chafes underneath my arms because I've got quite a bit of weight. It just nips on the hoist. When there's a minefield incident, the only way to reach the casualties quickly is from the air. This is where the IRT comes in. Regular members of the team have to be on permanent 24-hour call. We're all on a pager system, which is a normal pager, but it's only relevant to this immediate area. If we go any further away from the Sibrovo area, we won't get paged. So we stay on the base all the time. We're also on 45 minutes notice to move, which obviously again ties us to this direct location. 
which is not a bad thing. We get to do, obviously, during the day, lots of physical exercise, which is pretty good for squaddies. Um, we tend to try and get as much training in as possible as well. It always seems a bit of a game until you, you know, until something happens to somebody you know, or or you're in a sit, or you're in a position where you've seen something happen to somebody else. And uh, no, I mean, I don't think it, I think people would be lying if they said they like the risk. That's why you do so much training because you're trying to negate the risk. An emergency drop on a minefield is dangerous, and the training carries inbuilt risks. If the helicopter were to get into trouble while someone was on the line, they'd be cut loose however high up they were. Inside the helicopter they've got some wire cutters and while you're winching down, if there's any problems with the helicopter and they have to ditch, then it's the loadmaster's job to cut you free. So that if, um, if the helicopter's going down, rather than try and winch you back up or winch you down, they just cut you free. But um, it's probably safer just to be free falling from about 50 feet than it is to go down in the helicopter or be dragged along with it. So. I know, it's, it's only 50 feet or 100 feet at the maximum, so... What, and you but, say you just drop? Yeah, it's better than going down with the helicopter, or if the helicopter goes down, you get dragged along into power lines, things like that. I think that's why they do it, but that's quite a daunting part of the job. The EOD, the Explosive Ordnance Disposals Unit, led by Sergeant Dare, is a key element of the immediate response team. This is generally the EOD's equipment on your left at the moment, and also my radio operator, it's just general mishmash of equipments that we can pick up very quickly and take with us if it's needed. Uh, for myself, I carry a satellite telephone, I've got my body arm helmet, which obviously we need in theatre, and I've got my overnight kit, just in case we're left on the ground. My number two carries a bit more equipment, um, my number three and four carry the mine prodding and mine detection equipment, if it is required. Behind me, I have the mines map. What we have is this big long line of dots. The red dots denoting either a mine or a mine field within that vicinity. We have the yellow dots telling us that the ground has been cleared to VRS standard, that is the local army, but it's not clear to UN standard, which means a possible threat within that area. Bosnia is pockmarked with red and yellow dots. At the current rate of progress, demining the country will take a century. So NATO's mine disposals team, led by the British, has an important mission to promote mine awareness, especially among children. Mines being such a, such a threat in the country, we try and uh, inform people at the grassroots level, and that is at the, the children level, because they're more receptive to learning about the dangers of mines. You find a lot of the adults are, are, are it's very hard to put a cost to them, the threat. So we find that the aim of the programme is to go into schools and teach the kids directly about the risk of mines. And we deliver them a mine um, training package, very similar to the one that the soldiers receive before they come out here. So they go through types of mines, what they look like, and also we just talk about the risk that they have. So, and Do you get a lot of accidents with kids? There has been a number of accidents with, with children um, throughout the whole area. Ch children are naturally inquisitive. They, they see something on the ground, they, they want to pick it up or, or play with things, and, and sometimes they don't recognise exactly what they are. The British Army has sole responsibility for mine awareness throughout the country. Today, Lieutenant Treffrey Kingdom and his Serbo-Croat translators are visiting a primary school at Valari near Shipova. These children are the post-war generation. Born in the mid-90s, they don't remember the fighting, so they need to be taught from scratch about the legacy of the war. Lieutenant Treffrey Kingdom's first job is to stress how serious a business this is. OK, well, what we're going to do today is um, Drago and Dushko are two guys who work for me at the mine cell and they're going to teach you guys about the risk and the dangers of mines. Have, have any of you ever seen a, a, any mines or minefields around here at all? No, good. Well, that's the best way because that way, if you haven't seen them, you're safe. So. What we're trying to do is, by, by training you guys, we want to keep children across the whole of Bosnia safe from mines. So uh, that's good. If you haven't been any, near any minefields, I'm going to keep you safe. So I'm pleased to hear that. What, what we've found is, over the years, with the increase of mine awareness training with Dushka and Drago and people like themselves going around to schools, the actual injuries to children has dramatically tailed off. Um, and there are figures that show uh, during the war and then just after the period of the war, the number of injuries happened to both adults and children was relatively high. Uh, and as it creeped uh, towards the millennium, it has dropped off, um, dropped off remarkably. So it, it quite clearly shows that the, the job that these guys do is being taken on board by the children and, and there are less and less injuries happening.
The immediate response team is based at Shipova, next to the main army hospital in northern Bosnia. The plan in today's exercise is to winch six people down from 30 meters onto the roof of a Land Rover and then back up again. Two of those on the exercise today are doing it for the first time. The weather's cold and wet, so the journey down won't be fun. The IRT's on permanent standby to fly to any major emergency, road accidents, mine explosions, or vehicles that have driven into a minefield. The team is multidisciplinary including anaesthetists, fire officers and bomb disposal experts. They carry a full medical kit, including a defibrillator. There are so many minefields here that training focuses on winching personnel down onto the roofs of vehicles, because that's the only safe place in the middle of a minefield. If we got a, a winch onto a vehicle, I'd be the first man out, so I'd put a harness on. The load mast would then winch me down onto the vehicle. I'd get off, off, the ha off of the hoist onto the vehicle, connect a line to the hoist. That would then go back up, which means I'd have control of the hook. So whoever we needed on the vehicle, they would get down, sent down individually, and I'd be able to pull them into myself rather than be swinging about. It's more difficult, really, for the pilots because it's a small target going onto a vehicle, especially if it's windy and if we've had to come from any height. Uh, it's obviously more difficult for them to get me on that exact point, so we'd be swinging about a little bit until we could get me onto the vehicle. What sort of heights do you winch down from? Uh, well, the lower the better, but really probably 90 foot uh, reason for that. Any lower, there's a, a slight, very slight chance that uh, the aircraft may set off any mines in the area with the downdraft. Mm -hmm. IRT training has to take place right next to the base because the team has to be capable of responding to a real emergency when it occurs. The load master is responsible for the operation of the hoist, balancing the weight within the helicopter, safety in the cabin, and in wartime, firing the machine gun. Corporal Dixon, bomb disposal expert, is first to go down. IRT helicopter training takes place two or three times a week in all weathers. On other days, the team practices what to do once they reach the ground. After my assessment, I'll probably ask for the, the mines dog and the dog handler to come down. Reason for that is I'll I'd get him to clear a, a safe working area for the medical staff to come down. Coming up, the dogs that go where mortals fear to tread. How would you feel on your first descent? And Bosnia's children learn survival skills. The immediate response team is training for emergency rescue operations. Lance Corporal Jay Crafter is a dog handler working with the IRT's explosives detection dogs. A team member is standing in as a casualty. Steady mate, we're nearly there. Well, basically the dog's trained to follow the cork at the end of my prodder. Everywhere the prodder goes, the dog will search. So. I move left to right, right to left system of search, dog follows it. When the dog finds the kit that's in the ground or whatever, he'll indicate, tell me that there's something there. Goes into passive position, he'll either sit or go down and look at the ground where the source is, the centers. And from there, 
I can judge by looking at the train, wind direction, whatever, which way is to, best to go. Pull back two meters, I'll either go left or right, whatever suits me at the time, or whatever I think is best to get to the casualty quickest. Get to the casualty, medics will come in. First aid can be given. Steady. The dog has to search for mines, ignoring cries for help and any other distractions, till the area can be declared safe. When he scents explosives, he's trained to sit and wait, whatever happens. And he's been well trained. He's valued at 55,000 pounds. Okay. There you see my dog's uh, giving a passive response. Where the prodder is now, there's something which has caused him, you know, uh, interest to make him indicate. It could be anything from TNT, or anything that contains TNT, grenade, you know mine, whatever. As you can see, he's not distracted by anyone around. He's not going to move. I'm doing the same now. Help! 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 Dog's not going to move. Real situation. Obviously, you're going to get stuff like that. Smoke coming in. Good boy! Hey, what you got there? Dog's got his reward. He thinks a tennis ball is going to come from the ground. Come on, then. Thinks tennis ball is going to come from the ground. Sent to him. This is a tennis ball. You see, that's how it works, really. Come on, then. Come here. You're going to spot that dog. Come here. What you got? What you got, boy? Come here. This suit here is going to offer me some sort of protection, uh, you know, a mine threat or something along those lines. Um, it's a lightweight EOD suit. Uh, it's obviously, it restricts you a lot, uh, especially when you're doing the winching. Coming outside the chopper, you don't get much movement. You've got to be very careful but it's there to, you know, protect me. Back up in the helicopter, Lieutenant van der Linden's big moment has arrived. The helicopter is as low as it can safely go on a winching operation. The loadmaster is Sergeant John Peters. He's in close contact with the pilot, Captain Bolschelmann, on the radio. The pilot can't actually see the person being winched, so the loadmaster has to be the eyes and ears of the whole operation. It might look easy, but it isn't. It's a fine art, especially in high winds. It needs teamwork and precision. It's going well. Lieutenant van der Linden gets an easy ride. She doesn't have to drop down onto the Land Rover itself. Next down is the radio operator, who's experienced at dropping down from the helicopter. At first, it looks as if he too isn't going to hit the roof of the Land Rover, but the crew take into account the force of the wind, and he makes it. And yes, it is a very dangerous job, but while you're doing the job, you don't think of that aspect. The fear comes into it more after when you think about what you've just done, not whilst you're actually doing that job at that said time. It's, your training takes over. It's, it's like any aspect of the army, no matter what you do, your training kicks in first. You carry out the job that you've been told to do, and then afterwards when you sat down and you a cup of tea and a cigarette, you think about what you've just done and what could have happened. We've got a few guys here that have never winched before, so it's, it's a good experience to get in underneath the rotors, come down in the helicopter and actually land, which is a good thing, and get used to couple dicks and actually, actually controlling them on the ground as well as. And obviously with the vehicle, which is our main priority, to get guys and, and the ladies trained on the vehicle side of life in case it is in a minefield at some point. As you can see, it makes it a lot harder with the down wash, with the noise, and obviously with this bad weather that we've got at the moment. So no, I feel that went very, very well. That was good. What goes down must come up.
it would be unfortunate to get stuck underneath the helicopter itself. Last man up and time to go home. This time on the way down it was quite windy so I was spinning around so if, if I was to look down I'd have moved my helmet down and then the rope would have got in front of my face and that, that's quite painful so I, I don't really bother but on the way up it was alright so I had a good look about and enjoy the scenery while we go up. It takes the air tension away from the pain that's underneath my armpits. Completely trust the other people's, the ones up and the one down. No engine Well, they'll bring you safe down and they'll bring you safe back up. Back at school in Valari, the mine awareness team works specifically to prevent the kind of emergencies that the IRT would have to deal with. The Serbo-Croat translators have learned all about mines from the British bomb disposal officers, so they give the talks. We are telling them what the danger represents, you know, if they see something which looks like that, you know, not to uh, come closer, to go back to tell the parents, you know, the best way is to tell police about that, you know, so uh, some the mining crew can come over there. And The British Army defused these mines themselves. Some are homemade. During the war, both sides planted so many that they ran out of supplies of manufactured mines and started a cottage industry of mine making. During the war time, nobody was thinking about that problem. You know. In a psychotic situation like we have in Bosnia, you never know when the new war can break out, you know, nobody think about these things, you know. So people were just planting mines during the, <laughs> during the war, nobody was thinking about lifting them. The children of Bosnia are the future of this country. The army's job will have been worthwhile if they can grow up unscathed and if they can avoid the pain of division and war in this volatile part of the world.